So uh, let's kick off. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Jackie Fox, who's the Managing Director and Security Lead of Accenture Ireland. And she's also the Vice Chair of the Board of Cyber Ireland, as well as an adjunct professor in UCD and also a proud UCD alumna. So Jackie, how are you today? I'm well, thank you very much, Patricia, and thank you very much for having me today. Um, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much. So I suppose the first question for our listeners is where are you located today, Jackie, and what's keeping you sane as you continue to uh, work at home and socially isolate? OK, well, I, I'm located in Black Rock in Dublin in Ireland today, and um, I, I'm not so sure how, how sane I am actually keeping throughout all this. I'm doing my best to stay sane. Um, I'm enjoying doing my work still, uh, but I'm also doing quite a bit of reading and walking. So um, I'm listening to audio books in the evening. Um, and in the moment, I'm in the middle of a book called Sandworm, which is about cybersecurity and hacking and industrial control systems and things. So I'm really enjoying that at the moment. So that's trying to keep myself sane that way. Great. So I'm sure our readers will have loads of questions on that and don't, our, our listeners. So, so um don't forget, listeners, if you'd like to submit your questions, you can do so at the bottom of your screen via the chat function. So Jackie, um, another question for you. Uh, what has changed, I suppose, so much about your work in, in during COVID-19? What has changed for you and your work? Well, I suppose there are some constants in that, you know, I, I focus on helping organisations to uh, improve their security posture, to make them more secure for, for when they're attacked. I also do a lot of breach investigations as well when somebody is um, attacked or infiltrated. And um, so at the moment, we're finding that, that, you know, the motivations for people and why they're actually going into systems ha has increased. So there's a lot of social engineering going on at the moment, people sending phishing emails, you know, trying to pull up people to make them click on things for cures for COVID or how do I know if I've got symptoms of COVID? And they're very aware and very in tune with, with what might attract people to, to click. Um, and the other thing is, is that there's a, quite a big uptick in uh, people looking, you know, into organisations that may be like life sciences, like manufacturers who might have potential uh, vaccines or cures for COVID or be working on that sort of thing. So there's a lot of organisations who've had to up their cybersecurity and their monitoring. Um, so that all becomes very relevant in my world where I'm dealing with clients and trying to help them either not be breached or, to, to you know, when they are breached. So. So just a little bit delve deeper into your work. So you sound very passionate about what you do. So uh, just tell us a little bit more about your work, if you wouldn't mind, please. Sure. Well, um, day to day, I spend most of my time with clients um, and, uh, you know, tr try to help them understand what maybe the risks to them are or for them to communicate what the risks are to us okay. so that we can translate that into what they might be able to do to secure themselves. And uh, the type of worries clients might come to us might be, you know, they may be worried they have intellectual property that's going to get stolen. Mm -hmm. They may be worried that they have websites that are going to be defaced or they may be worried that you know, they won't be able to keep the lights on or provide whatever services they have uh, to their customers or consumers or whatever it is. So, so we help people kind of deal with whatever problems they have and advise them about how they can put in layered kind of controls to stop those, those fears they have happening. Okay, so just, I suppose we're curious about to, to understand what has changed for your own work. You know, in, in COVID-19 has changed so much, but but what has changed uh, and, and have you seen any creative ideas really arising out of, you know, this whole COVID-19 crisis? Uh, yes, um, uh, you know, kind of it's it's different for me working from home. I'm used to being around, you mm. know, my own team that I work with um, and I'm used to spending time with clients. Now, cybersecurity workers are actually classed as essential workers, so we are allowed to work with clients, but obviously we're using a lot of judgment as to whether or not we need to. Um, so with people moving into that working from home environment where they used to sit maybe on a corporate network and uh, they had it all secured by the organization that they worked for, now they might be working from home and their home network is kind of part of an attack surface basically for people. So, um, you know, looking at the kind of, you know, uh, insecurities that can, and vulnerabilities that can be introduced 
from the working in home perspective and then also trying to keep up with the innovations of the cyber criminals and uh, what their latest idea is because in general it's a bit of a cat and mouse game between you know the criminals and the cyber security mm -hmm. security people who are trying to 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 work against them so um we are kind of trying to squash down their innovations or maybe think about what they might try and do next and and plan as to how we we could either look for that or or mitigate against it yeah, so loads of creative ideas there. So, so a little bit more maybe on on creative ideas coming from the hackers. I mean, what are they doing new things during this time? Are they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like as I referred to earlier, they've they've got a lot of kind of social engineering techniques to try and draw people in psychologically to click on links and get them to download malware. But a lot of them are COVID related at the moment, so they're trying to entice entice people in that way. Um, and again, their their targets are slightly different because, you know, we're seeing you know nation states kind of looking between each other, and you know there, there absolutely will be a monetary race for if somebody can produce a vaccine or a cure for COVID, and um, obviously there's huge value in that. So we'd see people trying to infiltrate into networks to sit and wait, um, even if something hasn't uh, been there, but where they think there might be a potential for that. It's probably relevant from a college and university perspective mm -hmm. as well, actually, on that front. Really interesting. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. So my last question then for you is: It sounds like is you've got a quite an uh, you have to put a quite a multidisciplinary or an interdisciplinary team together would that be right would that be true very much so um i think it's a common mistake that people make that that cybersecurity is all around technology and um, because absolutely you know a lot of our team are made up of technologists but we also need people who can liaise with legal people um who can speak to hr like for example if an organization is breached somebody has typically clicked on something or made a mistake so hr is very involved uh in in actually helping advise and how you deal with that uh, marketing and communications both to market kind of cybersecurity internally in an organization organization and if you've had a breach how is that communicated externally um, and speaking you know we could be speaking to a board about something someday and we could be speaking to somebody in a technology unit another day so there's lots of different skill sets needed in order to make the cyber security ecosystem actually work okay so we've lots of questions for you Jackie um, and <laughs> uh, we'll try and get through them all so any more questions please do submit them but uh, let's start off with how did you end up in a career involving cyber security that's a good question um yeah it was never really a plan to be honest with you um and, and it's funny I, I was speaking at something um in old juries um about a year and a half ago um and i stood up and i said you know the last time i remember being in this room was at my depth and i sure mm -hmm. didn't know then that i was going to end up working in cyber security because it didn't exist as a discipline then um so um i started off kind of doing computer science um and uh, doing technology started getting interested in the idea of securing things and hacking and backups and and viruses when they started coming out they all interested me and then they kind of got collectively brought together as this discipline called security so actually i took a career break for about seven years and then I went back and did a master's in UCD in security and forensics. And I absolutely knew at that point, this is what I wanted to do. So I had an opportunity to go back to work then after having my career break. And I've never been happier. I absolutely love what I do. Well, it sounds, it sounds wonderful. Kind of. Yeah, sounds great. Um, uh, so how easy or difficult is it to communicate cyber securely? I hope I said that properly. <laughs> um, it really depends. Um, some people are are good at adjusting their message to an audience. Um, so, uh, but I, I think you have to be acutely aware of the audience that you're speaking to. So, if you're speaking to a group of technical people, you're going to speak very differently about a cybersecurity issue than you would if you're speaking to a group of business people, or if you're speaking to a group of citizens, for example, or the government. So, I think it's very important to tune your message. So, um, the difficulty is around. Uh, having the same message but tuning it for the audience as opposed to the difficulty of speaking about it I think. Okay so is there any uh, specific online behaviour you would advise against where it's not obviously risky? This is um, from a personal context I suppose. Yeah, I, I think one of the things we hear being repeated over and over again is, you know, using kind of good, strong passwords and not reusing them across multiple sites, because there's a presumption that, you know, if you're signed up to many services, some of those will get breached over time. And if you've shared mm -hmm. the password on one, somebody gets access to it on another, then, you know, you're, you're you've been captured, basically. 
Um, so I think having good cyber hygiene around your use of passwords is very good. I think paying some heed to the type of websites that you visit um, and thinking twice. Um, if you feel something doesn't feel right, then it probably isn't right. Um, and uh, it's probably a good idea to back out of something. Um, you know, like if banks contact, if you think you've been contacted by your bank or, you know, government service saying, yeah, you've got a refund or, oh, you've got an invoice for something. Like if you weren't expecting the communications, be suspicious of it. Um, and, and just, you know, if it's important, somebody will get back to you. Like I ignore a lot of cons that come into me and I just think, you know what, they'll ring me, they'll find a different route of getting to me if that's actually important. So even things that kind of sound urgent or important, I'm often kind of ignore them because I'm thinking, oh, that's a fish, that's a hack. So, so okay. I think thinking about things. So. Okay, thanks, Catherine. So next question for you, are universities vulnerable to cyber attacks and how so? I think everybody is uh, vulnerable mm -hmm. to cyber attacks. I think universities have a very unique dynamic in that a large uh, group of their user corpus is made up of students who inherently, um, in a lot of cases, aren't as risk averse as, as a typical population. Um, and it's a very large population and there's a huge balance between allowing them to explore and, and utilize the infrastructure to do what they need to do as a student um, versus actually securing it and stopping them doing things. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, kind of the idea of, you know, what do universities have that are valuable to people? Any organization, I'd say, look at your assets, you know, your assets mm -hmm. might be research your lecture material people might want to know what exam results they're getting or to change their exam results or think about the things that people might actually want to uh, target and why um, okay. and maybe websites keeping your websites in front face from being defaced in case you have somebody who's annoyed with you um, so everywhere is a target you just need to work out your assets and try and protect those a little bit more than you might the periphery of things so. okay we've a couple more questions in about four minutes to get through them so i'll try my okay. best um, how important uh, was GDPR for cybersecurity and does it cover everything? I think GDPR was hugely supportive for cybersecurity and um, data protection. Um, you know, it, it's protecting data, which is a lot of the driver for what we're trying to do with cybersecurity. Um, it put a lot of rules in place about making sure that people took responsibility for the data they had, that somebody owned that data, that they looked at how they were processing that data and made sure that it was reasonable and that they had a legal basis for doing that in the first place. So it made people um, think about what they were holding, how long they were holding it for, whether they really needed it or not. Um, it, it definitely covered that aspect of things, um, not maybe so much around the kind of hacking um, element of things and maybe mm -hmm. some of the controls that needed to be put in place, but they forced people to think about it, uh, certain aspects and also putting in, you know, reg regulatory fines is always a good driver to make people take something seriously. So yes, I think it's been hugely important, but it certainly doesn't cover all aspects of cybersecurity. Okay, so here's one for you. So we'll try and cover two more before the, in the last kind of, 90 seconds to two minutes what are your top tips for cybersecurity in the home in the home yeah. um make sure you've got a password on your wi-fi and um, that you don't have open wi-fi for people to to go into um if you are putting like kind of you know fancy new um iot devices onto your network it's great if you can have it on a segregated piece of the network rather than all thrown in together because they you know, tend not to have security as well built in as maybe some traditional products. Um, so they can open up vulnerabilities onto other systems. And if somebody can get onto one device on your network, in general, they can travel around to other devices. So I think about the IoT devices that you're putting on Internet of Things. Um, make sure you've got a password on your Wi-Fi and uh, make sure you know what your kids are doing um, and other people who you might be sharing the network with, whether they're causing problems, whether they're safe and secure, whether it's suitable for all the users who you might have and whether you have any users in there that you don't want. <laughs> you should be able to see those things okay so second last question i think so this is i th it's a little bit long now so you'll have to wait for it to hear me so i think the question is more technical security mm -hmm. is interdisciplinary but are non-tech people getting more interested in it uh, example for people with skills in fraud social engineering physical legal risk hr etc i suppose yes I, 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 I think very much so area. Yeah, I, I think very much uh, that interdisciplinary uh, aspect is becoming more and more important in security because 
you know, it, not wanting to stereotype people, but now I'm going to do that, having said not wanting to do it. A, a lot of people who work in security are techies, you know, and, and techies are not famed for their, you know, communication skills. So um, we often need people to help us kind of interpret the message and make sure that it's getting through. And I think more and more um, cybersecurity is becoming a governmental and a policy issue. Um, and people who are trained technologists aren't necessarily strong in policy, law, um, and those areas as well. So you'll find some people who will, you know, very comfortably hop between different disciplines, but certainly the policy side of things is not for everybody. And it's very, very important for the security, uh, for national security and citizen security, um, that somebody is thinking that on a policy uh, perspective to protect those that can't protect themselves and to protect our national infrastructure as well. Okay, and the last question then for you, Jackie, is about the book you're reading. So do you want to tell the audience just about the book you're reading and what it's in, in 30 seconds, what's it about? Yeah, it's it's a book called Sandworm, and um, it's basically about um, a little bit about the history of hacking on industrial control systems and things like critical infrastructure like power and water um, and about how this came about, uh, which nations are involved, what the politics are behind that, why they started doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of it is about kind of going, this really is happening, people. It's not science fiction. It's not if this happens in the future, it's that it is happening. Um, it's looking a little bit around kind of policy that's been developed in different countries to deal with this. And I suppose, you know, there's a lot of it that you can fast forward into kind of think, well, if we don't do something about this, what we have an opportunity today, what's it going to look like tomorrow um, with cybersecurity being, you know, one of the new aspects of war, like, so you've got air, space, you know, kind of um, sea um, and, and kind of face to face, but now you've got cyber as well and the impact of that on different uh, nations. So, so that's in a nutshell what it's about and, and it's very sounds interesting. Sounds fantastic. Sounds wonderful. Thanks, Jackie. So we even got a, a, a reading recommendation out of this as well. So thanks so much, Jackie. A huge thanks and thanks to our audience for listening in. And if you'd like to sign up, you can do so at uh, www.ucd.ie forward slash discovery or zoom for talk. So see everybody next week. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thanks, Jackie. Bye.